The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Greetings to everybody. You are all welcome to today's ISCBA webinar on Hospital Users Manual Penetrating the General Public with Patient Safety. Uh, today's presenter is Dr. Heon Cho Jeon, who is currently a Director of International Affairs for the Korean Society for Patient Safety and Distinguished Advisor to the Korea Institute for Healthcare Accreditation and serves on Incident Management Faculty for the Canadian Patient Safety Institute. Dr. Jeon is also Johns Hopkins Trained Quality and Safety Specialist. He was a 2007 WHO Safety Scholar John Hopkins, sum, summer scholar from 2006 to 2012, and has won Korean Minister of Health and Welfare Award twice in 2005 and 2013, as well as John Hopkins Alumni Associate Award in 2014. His book, Hospital Users Manual, 33, rules, 33 Safety Rules for Patients, became a national bestseller in Korea and led many Korean hospitals to develop patient engagement programs for safer care. In this webinar, Dr. John, an ISQA fellow, will share strategies to bring all the stakeholders together in improving patient safety, patients, their family, healthcare organization, and legislation. Just to remind you that today's presentation will take approximately 45 minutes and we will leave 10-15 minutes at the end for any questions that you may have. Please type your questions into the question or chat box, pro chat, uh, box provided and they will be posed to Dr. John at the end of this session. Please enjoy the presentation and over to you Dr. John. Hello everybody, I'm Dr. Hernje Jung and it's a great honor for me to be here. So I'm going to talk about, well, it's my book, Hospital Users Manual, and the title of the presentation is Penetrating the General Public with Patient Safety. Well, penetrating is not my fav favorite word, but actually for this topic, this is the most suitable word, I think. As Juliana introduced me, yeah, I'm this person, and well, you don't have to memorize all the things. And you can find you know, more of my information at John Hopkins' website, so yeah, please feel free to visit there. And my job usually, you know, teaching hospitals and healthcare workers about patient safety and being interviewed to TVs, radios, newspapers on safety and quality of care like this. And but today, instead of you know technical things and you know complicated ideas on safety, I am going to talk about a fairy tale, a tale from my country, South Korea. So please enjoy it and just relax. So 2008 is an important year to me and that is the year when I began to talk about patient safety in my country. And I gave several lectures to hospitals and the first, wow, the first sentence I heard from the hospital was this, you became an enemy of doctors. Believe it or not, you know, the word patient safety had, you know, very negative connotation in my country because patient safety is always, you know, related to some malpractice issues and lots of cases. So doctors really hated the word patient safety. That's 2008. And in 2014, there's an important thing. Okay, let me read this. On December 29th, just three months ago, 2014, the Korean National Assembly passed the patient safety law. The bottom line of the law is to develop a nationwide voluntary reporting system and to ensure no penalty is awarded to either the organization or healthcare workers involved in the incidents. The point is here. One of the most active groups that called on such non-punitive law was not doctors, not nurses, Career Alliance of Patients Organization, Patients. They asked this. So they 
instead of focusing on grief and outrage and persecution, they contributed to a highly mature safety culture that prioritized prevention through cooperation. So, how did this happen? That's the question that I'd like to answer today. Well, from the last slide, you might, you know, some of, for some of you, the word patient engagement popped up in your mind. And that's right, patient engagement is probably the right word for that, but today I'm going to use patient-driven safety improvement. This is a stronger you know, phrase or word, and I prefer this. Before we move on further, there's a disclaimer I have to say, and I am not the only one who made the changes. So many great people are working on, working to improve safety hand in hand. The case of this presentation describes my part, specifically my part in getting patients on board to the journey for the safer care. So, you know, I heard the word that you became an enemy of doctors, and I found that the, the improvement in patient safety was too slow. So in 2011, you know, four years ago, I made up my mind to, I decided to change the game drastically. So I first did situational analysis of my country. That's 2011 information. So let me just you know briefly describe the topography of Korea medical atmosphere. Well, it's a world map. So where is your country? And or where's Korea? Can you point it? It's here. It's very small. And the information is there. Are, the population is 50 million. It's around one sixth of that of the U.S. population, and there are several hospitals. So the Superior General, General, these these nomenclature is not you know from me. It is from the Korean government. So I just you know keep this. So there are you know in 2014, 3,576 hospitals in Korea. Yeah, not this small. So I'm going to give you more information, Korea. This is OECD information and number of doctors is very, it, not that many in OECD, among the OECD countries. And number of nurses, also very small. But interestingly, number of beds is very, no, no, there are many beds, patient beds in Korea. So you can imagine there are many patients in the hospital because there are many beds, but you know, we are suffering from lack of nurses and lack of doctors. You imagine what happened. And there's an interesting aspect. This is the map that I drew. So hierarchy, the power distance index from Hofstad research. And basically what you can see is the, the lighter color means there's no power distance among, you know, older, elder, or younger people, or whatever. And in Asian countries, it's probably darker here. Which means, in Korea, there is some, you know, steep power gradient among healthcare professionals, like, you know, nurses and doctors, uh, interns and residents, and staff physician. Yeah, those people. So in summary, yeah, healthcare workers are busy, always busy and understaffed, which means highly error-prone condition, blame is common, speak up is difficult. Are you familiar? Yeah, I think you are. This is the situation of you know, medical atmosphere in 2011. And we did not have many safety experts, so hospital healthcare, you know, healthcare workers used to say that we don't know what we should do regarding patient safety. That's the Korean situation. So the bottom line is healthcare workers, although doctors, nurses, including hospital managers, they were frustrated. They didn't know what to do. 
and they had fear, huge fear about my practice things. So this was the situation, a very practical situation. <laughs> now you can imagine why I heard this sentence. You became an enemy of doctors. So now let's move on to the patient side, how patient felt the situation. <sighs> this picture of this young boy was a leukemia patient and in 2010. He died of being Christian wrong route injection. So yeah, well known critical issue, but in 2010, the same thing happened in Korea and this young boy passed away. So events occur in Korea. So people say, I don't believe doctors, I don't believe hospitals, hospital might be a dangerous place. So watch your doctors, watch your nurses. Patients and probably the general probably felt this way, anger and fear and distrust about the hospitals. To summarize, hospitals, the right side, lack of resources, information, and probably the executives did not support healthcare workers well regarding patient safety. And patient side, they also did not, you know, they, they didn't have information on safety but they had fear, fear of getting harmed. So between two group, patients and hospitals, there's a huge distrust. It's, <laughs> yeah, I should say it's very bad, but there's a hope. The hope is, from my understanding, both sides were honest and sincere and missed in saving lives. So this is the basic summary, the situational analysis of mine in 2011 about Korean medical atmosphere about patient safety. Please keep in mind this. So according to the analysis, I had to come up with a strategy to change the situation. So my strategy, strategy to change the game was to give information to patients first. Well, actually, I, I've been giving information to healthcare workers, doctors, and nurses, and in academic conferences, all the things. So technically, I've been giving information to all the people. But at this point, I decided to focus on patient and the general public. So, I wrote this book. So you can see the big title, the red mean, one, there's a hospital, and Sayong Sayong is user's manual. So, hospital user's manual, that's the main title, and you can see 33 safety rules for patients. Well, it's, you know, some yellow color and a white background, it's pretty, you know, cute cover. The, well, the reason why I'm showing this to you is this part. This pretty illustration. So I believe the, the participants of this seminar, you guys already know that why I put this illustration there and what this picture stands for, right? This is cheese, especially Swiss cheese. Yeah. So let's talk about it more. So, in the prologue chapter, I had to explain the concept of Swiss cheese model to people even though I did not mention the exact word Swiss cheese, but I gave some information, some background. Just think about this. Well, I did not choose hospital. I chose a semiconductor factory. The reason, yeah, you can feed it in a few minutes. Think about it. A semiconductor factory operating for the past 20 years caught on fire last night. 
initial investigation showed the following. So one of the electrical machineries was short circuited. There were a lot of flammable materials in the vicinity and the security guard was asleep. Well, from the three information, how do you think? Or, well, maybe let's just you know, show this to general public and ask them what's the cause? Yeah, really, this this was a question. What or who caused the fire? And the answer. So, what would be the answer in your country, in your culture? Well, in my country, the answer is quite simple. The security guard, right? Why? Because there's an old saying in Korea that uh, if something happens, somebody should resign. That's the main idea. So in this case, the person was security guard, and that's the criminal who caused the fire. That's the simple logic, and we safety experts call it person approach, right? Then I gave them more information. So in that the investigation showed the following things. First, the factory was built more than 20 years ago, so it had high risk of short circuit. Sure, they received a fire inspection a week before, only a week before, and passed without any correction. So the fire inspection was not thorough, and the cleaning services of flammable material was on strike for four days, failing to remove flammable garbage near the accident site. And obviously, the security guard was on duty for two days in a row. At this point, with this in-depth information investigations, well, maybe, oh, this is a how, how I frame the things and give information to public. So just, you know, listen to me like you are listening to fairy tale again. I said this, okay, maybe the facility thing and the fire inspects, inspection and cleaning services and security guard, oh, there's a typo, sorry. These could be protecting barriers against fires, right? And there are many you know, <laughs> barriers here. And, you know, for the safety, in the safety fields, we traditionally use the word, you know, diagram like a Swiss cheese in standing for the protecting barrier. Then I show this. Okay, then how it happened? The factory was built long, long time ago. It had a high risk of short circuit. The facility barrier, the, there's a, the, the barrier was not working correctly, properly. So there's a, there are holes in the barrier, right? We all know this. And the fire inspection was not thorough. Again, there are holes and cleaning services on strike. So again, holes and the guard was working too hard. Again, holes. So the point is, there are so many different holes in so many different layers. And probably the older layers and how the, how the factory caught on fire. Yeah, that's because all the things happen in the same night, the same factory, like this. So at this point, people, including the general public, began to change, began to change their paradigm, began to discard their old paradigm. That's a magical moment. Let me, you know, give you more information. So I asked them so far what what we have done so far about this kind of accident would be punishing the security guard or retraining the security guard. These are the things we typically did do. We'll fire them. Well but you guys now know that this empty answer, this kind of approach cannot prevent the fire accidents, a similar accident in the future. 
So what we have to do is make each and every of preventing protection barriers intact and solid, plugging all the holes. And probably we can build more layers of cheese, right? So believe it or not, general public agree with this, really agree with this. They do buy this. And this is a grain line. Blaming an individual, blaming a healthcare personnel does not change the factors and conditions that contribute the errors. And the same error is likely to occur. Yeah. Safety experts, we know this, but general public get them to understand this kind of idea. It's not easy, but this kind of presentation does work. And this is the first chapter of my book. This is the bottom line. This is a punchline. So, healthcare professionals are not stupid. They are dedicating themselves to improving patient safety. So, they have built several layers of cheese to protect patients. People buy this. Like this. This, uh, this is an illustration in my book. But there's a patient and there are several barriers. And you can see this is an adaptation of a dream reason species model. But yeah, I like, like this pretty and cute picture. And then I told this sad story. Well, this is a true story that happened in Korea several years ago. No, a few years ago. Uh, a patient in his 70s or 80s, he got neck surgery was, and was moved to intensive care unit. And the, the doctor found that he had difficulty in breathing, so the doctor put pillow under the patient's shoulder to get the patient's neck extended. Two hours later, cardiac arrest. CPR, and the patient died. Well, later, the patient's wife came to the doctor and said that, well, I know you doctors and nurses did your best to save my husband. I know my husband was too old. I'm not blaming you. I, I'm not blaming you. But there's one thing I was angry. When I visited my husband in ICU, his pillow was under his shoulder, not under his head. I saw he was too uncomfortable. So I moved the pillow under his head. The physician couldn't say anything. He couldn't say that, well, you, the wife of the patient, might have killed your husband. This is a true story, and I wrote this story in my book. Well, so I said this, we, some, we and patient and patient family, we sometimes make holes in the cheese ourselves. But what if, what if we could protect the cheese? Even what if we become another layer of the cheese to save yourself, I mean ourselves, and our precious family? Then I ask them, do you want to know how? I hear resounding yes every time. They want to know how to protect themselves. They want to know how to protect the protecting barriers. So I built this website. <laughs> the funny name, imcheese.org. So we posted the things what 
you know, people can do in the hospital, some in information there. And April 2013, we consolidated all the material, the contents of the website, and published this book. Now, yeah, well, actually, you know, people in Korea and many people understand this illustration. So that I'm, I'm so glad that, glad about it. But here at this moment, I need to you know, talk about the rules of message, de message design in the book because this could be the, the meat of this presentation. So the normative target population of the book was the general public, not the healthcare professionals, and least normative popula target population. And therefore, do not make them fear. Here, that means the general public and excessive fear causes boomerang effects. You know, they just uh, began to ignore all the things. So even though I'm good at numbers like this, I did not show this kind of scary numbers in my book. Well, some of them, but it's too huge, too heavy information for general public to chew one time. And the next thing, this is it. Typical message format, how I framed it. So the thing is, hospitals do this and do this and this and that as slices of cheese. OK, this is what hospitals do. So what we need to do is this and this and that, not to make holes in the cheese or to be another layer of protection slice of cheese. Do you understand? This is a format. I first show what hospitals do, then move on to what uh, general public and patient and their family can do. Panda is in, as an example, you know, think about it. In this format, I give information like this. Well, hospital, in hospitals, healthcare workers like you know, doctors and nurses, they need to wash their hands every time before and after they see the patient. That is a rule. We show that, show that rule first. And then, well, this is because we want to pre, uh, prevent patients from hospital quite infection. But the thing is, even though doctors and nurses wash their hands every time, you, patient, patient safety, if you guys do not wash their your hands, we cannot protect the patient. This is the point. Well, there's a tricky thing too. <laughs> and I really like this. I carefully designed this kind of message is that, well, in my previous research, when do you think the doctors and nurses wash their hands? Yeah, most of the most of the time they do, but sometimes they skip this step. But my research said that if doctors and nurses, healthcare professionals perceive that patients or patient family know the rule they need to wash their hands, then doctors and nurses are more likely to wash their hands. Do you understand? So this book is you know, aiming the general public, but in the meantime, yeah. The, because this book became popular, doctors and nurses know that, people know that. So this is kind of a you know, two-prong approach, it's giving information to doctors and nurses and patient, patient and family at the same time and shaping their behavior at the same time. Well, and content-wise, we cover all the materials from international patient safety goals and even more, and be specific. So provide checklist-like things for patients and their family. Uh, for example, the, at the end of the book, there's a detachable checklist section. Uh, the inside is like this. And so, for example, in the middle section is for medication safety, and there are seven rules, seven things they have, yeah, people have to check, and there are other things for surgery or whatever. And on the right side, you can see the related pages, page number of the book. So we gave all the things in really, really easy format. 
So we try to be friend friendly and we try to be we try to make the book easy and interesting to read. Well, actually this illustration I like this and well the illustrator said that the guy is Dr. Jung. Well, I don't know, but Actually, this book is, is, is like a novel. So there's a two people, and one is Dr. Zhang. Actually, we call him Dr. J instead of Dr. Zhang. And there's a, one, a girl. He's a mother. She's a mother of a two-year-old boy. And they happen to, you know, just bump into uh, in a hospital. And they had a cup of coffee. And she had so many things to ask to Dr. Jung, Dr. J, because she knows that Dr. J is a safety expert, and actually Dr. J is explaining the things and writing the key points on the table napkin. So the, this kind of thing, the format, it, it should be you know, very friendly. And of course, ah, this cheese on the front cover stands for everything. So. Now, here's the thing, and I should be proud of this. Well, <laughs> this is a kind of book signing events in a hospital, in a large bookstore. I like the girl's facial expression and her smile. And the book became a bestseller, and even a bookstore in a big hospital carried the book all the time. And most importantly, I really love this. I really love this picture. So these are college students. Yeah, most of them are college students, university students. And they volunteered to support the patient safety improvement movement across the country. They volunteered to make a YouTube video an instruction material, uh, and they write all the things on their blogs. And for your information, the, the woman in pink shirt is the mother of the Bing Christian victim. Well, I'm so proud of these guys, and there are many more. So, we have talked about patient side. Now we talk about hospital, how hospitals embraced it. Okay, so I really love this part. Hospital executives, yeah, hospital executives from the book club to study it. And they renewed the hospital policy on safety and spread out around the hospital. And some clinics, you know, even small clinics bought hundreds of copies and gave out to their patients. And even a large hospital the president of a large hospital personally bought the books for his employees. I guarantee you there are thousands of employees and read these handwritten messages on the cover of the book. Oh, surely hospitals developed patient engagement programs based on the book. 2011, we already saw this hospital patient distrust distrust, lack of resources, information, or whatever. In 2015, hospitals now try to train and empower their healthcare workers and executives support those activities and patients. Patients taking part in being cheese too. And they say, blame does not work. Blame does not help. Can you believe it? I really love this change. So, I want to look, how do I expect the future? Well, quite honestly, we are suffering and we will be suffering from lack of doctors, and lack of nurses, and probably we will be still busy, understaffed, in highly error prone condition. We will be in that condition for a while. We all know that. But I should say, I should 
proudly say that we have these people. You know what? These guys, I really love these guys. These guys really paid a visit to the National Assembly. Can you believe that? And they met the congressmen and all the people, important people there. And they made the law, patient safety law, got passed in the National Assembly. I, it's a it's magical moment. These guys, these lovely guys, say that humans are fallible. Yeah, it's in you know, our, our terminology. We safety experts always say humans are fallible, but these general public, these university students, these you know, patient and patient family, now they say humans are fallible. These beautiful guys are working on developing a nationwide voluntary reporting system and ensuring no penalty to healthcare workers or reporters who are those who are involved in the case. And these lovely guys are contributing to a highly mature, no blame culture, admitting that healthcare workers are also human. So, I have to ask, ask myself, are we understaffed? Well, my answer, no. We are not. We are not understaffed. Maybe we, you know, we could say that we lack of doctors or lack of nurses or the things and too many patient beds and we are too busy. But are we understaffed? No, we are not. We are not understaffed. Why? Why? Because we have these guys. Oh, please understand that these there are only you know, 30 or 20 or 30 people in this picture, and there are so many other people participating in in this movement and so many general public, so many great people, so many reporters, newspapers, all the media writing how to save themselves and save, save patient, patient, family, all the materials are there and they are working together. So that's why I call this phenomenon patient-driven safety improvement. <laughs> yeah. This, this is the dream. This is the dream. This is a strategy. This is a, also a dream that I envisioned in a few years ago. I was frustrated. Now, but now we have so many. No, no, remember the picture. We have those guys. As a kind of a patient safety army, right? Well, I have to conclude this presentation with Eugene O'Neill's quote, a writer, and I love this. So man is born broken and he lives by mending. And the grace of God is true. Well, Juliana said it's a 45 presentation, but let's just, you know, stop here. I think is I already talked all the things I have to say today, and let's open up to questions and comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. John. Uh, thank you so much for this uh, exceptional fairy tale. We do indeed have a couple of questions, so we will start our Q&A session. And for everybody else, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat or question box uh, provided. So we'll start with the first question, and it's coming from Elom from Ghana. And he's saying, I agree with you on the fact that blaming an individual does not change the factors and the conditions that contributes to errors. What do you say to the fact that there are clear violations by individuals irrespective 
of how robust your systems are? Well, first of all, please say hi to Elon. Hi there. <laughs> Yeah, that is a very critical question, and that's the question actually I try to avoid today. And well, now that you raised the question, I try to answer it. Well, you know what? It, this is, that's is just culture, and sometimes people in hospital, healthcare workers, just you know, violate the rules, and those so active violations should be dealt with clearly. Well, maybe. In that case, we could use the terminology of punishment or something like that. But in this particular presentation, especially about this book, I, really, I explicitly I can say I intentionally avoid those kind of situations because if I, if, if the moment I bring that issue, and all the framework is just gone, that does not work. So in, in this particular book and presentation, the, how I frame the message is, okay, healthcare workers are good people and they, they are human, they are fallible. And patient and patient family, they are good people. The thing is, this, the ultimate safety can only be achieved by working together. But in, at this point, I strongly recommend you, if you choose to you know, do a strategy like this, and I, if I were you, I'd rather not deal with it in front of people. So be kind when you're using when you're using the strategy I came up with. But Aaron, please send an email to me directly. I can talk about it later with you. Okay, there's another question. Thank you, Dr. John. Uh, the next question is coming from Patricia McKernan. She's congratulating you on uh, your novel approach, which demonstrates the power of effectively engaging patients in safety efforts. And she's asking, is your book available in other languages and English, for example? <laughs> oh, thank you for asking that. Yeah, the book, yeah, actually my team is translating the book and the first chapter is like a you know, 50 page chapter that the prologue and first chapter is ready I mean in English so if you want to take a look at it please send an email to me I'm, I'm more than happy to share it with you is it okay yeah thank you so much thank you um, yeah. we will uh, maybe when uh, the book is translated we will we can send it to it to let our, our fellowship participants know that the when the whole book copy of the whole book is translated. Oh, that would be an honor for me. Perfect. And um, another question is coming from Opasana Aurora. She's from India and she's asking, how can we make our patients and their fam families being honest and sincere as, uh, because everybody these days uh, are just blaming hospitals. So uh, obviously Opasana um, and uh, especially in India, they're struggling with persuading the um, patients to um, be honest and uh, get engaged was, um, was, was the topic that you have presented. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I heard some stories from India, so, but I don't know if there's a whole story or not, but let me try to answer for the question. So what you have to understand this, regarding this concept is this is kind of a prob probability game. So I know there are several people, Maybe the majority is good pe people, and there are some bad apples and trying to make lawsuit cases all the time, whatever. But the thing is, it's not about you know rejecting hypothesis or not. So if you think there are thirty percent or forty percent of honest and sincere people, or at least the people who are interested in their themselves and their family, then you can just target those people first. And then expand on the you can expand the target on larger population. So in the yeah, that's the question. So many people ask me that question, but it's not just a one-time thing. So in my in this particular case in my country, it's you know, kind of working. And because I had you know, I know all the people in the media, but in your country, I know that it's really huge country, big population. Then I recommend you take a step by step approach, like you know, ten percent of the population first, and then expand. 
maybe can you send an email to me and we can talk about it. Sure. Um, thank you, Dr. John. And the next question is coming from Ahmad Bilal. Um, he's been wanting to ask about the transparency in patient safety in the hospital, especially about the incidents. Should uh, the healthcare professionals, and Ahmad Bilal in particular, he's asking, should we be transparent to patients, uh, patients and their family about reporting uh, about the incidents? Oh, Juliana, what happened? What's happening today? Why the patients are so important? Right? Do you understand what I'm saying? Well, so the question is, I, from my understanding, the question is about disclosure. Should we disclose or should not? That's the question, and that, from my understanding, that's the working definition of transparency. That's, it varies a lot country by country and region by region. So I'm working with Canadian people and they are very, you know, feel free to discuss the incident with their patient and they have solid rule to do that. At Johns Hopkins there is a rule, but quite honestly in my country and probably in many Asian countries there are not war not that many countries have such rules and not that many hospitals use those rules. But I really can't say it's suitable for your country or not. Maybe you can, in this case, for this particular case, you can try some you know, pilot study in kind of you know, government funded study in small hospital and compare the hospital, the result being transparency or I don't want to say not transparent, but ordinary hospital, then you can, the reason is you have to check the cultural situation of your country and healthcare atmosphere. But, and my answer is just to follow the analysis. So there's no gold standard, especially regarding the transparency issue. And be careful, I mean, remember, be careful, okay? Thank you, Dr. John. Uh, the next question is, were there any resistance from hospitals and healthcare workers in sharing safety information to general public? Uh, quite honestly, there were. Well, maybe not resistance, but healthcare workers had fear because, you know, I was, <laughs> I was quite popular among healthcare workers and healthcare industry and people knew that, heard that I was writing a book on patient safety and they, were, they sent me several emails and saying that, well, Dr. Zhang, please do, don't do that. Think about it, say 98,000 people may die from you know, preventable medical error in U.S. every year, things like that and then, then patients will panic and everything go right and yeah, I agree. But I published the book and on the day of the publishment, publishing and the fear just went away because the reason is the approach. I had the, the thing, the keyword, the balancing. So the message formation, the key from this uh, of my strategy is balance between hospital and patient. I never say, hospital, you need to do this, or patient, you need to do that. I always say, okay, hospital are doing this, so patient, you need to do this, then you two can complete each other and make the perfectly safe environment, safe hospital, and then message does work and that message, each of them agrees to follow that. Otherwise, yeah, and either the group just to resist or really hate the group, hate the message. And that is the last thing I want. I want it from this whole project. Okay? Thank you, Dr. John. The next question, so is it basically what's your doctor or nurse? For example, what if nurse forgot to double check patient's ID when she gives medication to a patient. Then 
what should the patient do? Like, do they, what procedure do they need to follow? Uh, do they report, need to report somewhere? What do they do? Oh, yes, that, that what your doctor thing is the most difficult part for me to write and make the message. So let me try to answer. So for this particular matter, we frame the message as, well, so regarding the double check part, uh, think about this. Well, maybe <laughs> this, this book is basically for the general public. They are the main reader. So we wrote this way. Expect your nurses call your name or check your name in your patient ID or your birth, date of birth. Please expect every time they check those things, right? Then this actually has two meaning, two you know, double prone approach too, because this mess message to healthcare workers, they need now they need to change their behavior because they know that patient, patient, family are expecting those things. They know the rules. Then this healthcare provider, like the hand hygiene case, they need to follow the rules more and more. It's again shaping the behavior of healthcare workers, though this book is written for the general public. In the meantime, for the public, there's a case like this. Okay, <laughs> especially some you know elderly people like you know, every time the nurses come and give medication, but ask their name and name and name again and again and again and they, the patient just got angry and shout, shouted that, why this hospital? What the hell is this hospital? Why, why the hell this hospital never remembers me or remember my name? Why are you asking me my name so many times? So the part we gave answer, well, this is not, we remember you. They're sure we remember you, remember your face, you remember your birthday, and remember your patient ID. The reason, if, if we ask your name again and again and again, that means we really do care you. So we gave those messages to two sides, right? Do you understand? So, well, maybe sometimes nurses or doctors forget to check the names or just to omit or skip the step, but we did not write report that to somewhere in the hospital because if I, if I wrote that, then again, this whole strategy just is blown. That's the point. We need to compromise. And this book is the first step, and we just make, you know, we, we really want to build the trust between hospital healthcare workers and patient and patient family. Thank you, Dr. John. And the next question, so how do you deal with the patients that haven't read the book? What did you say? How do you suggest um, uh -huh. we need to deal with the patients that haven't read the book, that they don't know the rules, they don't know what to expect? Oh, that's a great question. That's, that's a great question. I really like this. Okay, this is a very practical thing, and probably the, the audience can get one or two from this. Well, you know, publishing a book requires a publisher, right? And then, usually, if you have, you know, if you are a famous person who has some reputation, then probably you will have the right to decide which publisher you, you're going to choose. In my case, I chose a book publisher, a big publisher, and actually the publisher is a daughter company of the nation, nation's largest newspaper company. So the book and the contents and the summary was printed on the front page of the head section of the newspaper and cited several times. In the meantime, I was invited to you know, TV, radio, and all the, you know, the media. So even though people did not, some people did not have a chance to read the whole book, they could get some basic idea and the important things like the 33 rules or 10 
important rules, the sum summary of the 33, are shared well. This is the best part. So you should be ready to take advantage of the media of your country or your region. Thank you, Dr. John. Uh, the next question is coming from um, Nawaki um, Ichihara, and he's thanking you for this uh, very impressive story in Korea, and thanking you for sharing it. Uh, so he says, I can imagine there may have been mixed reaction among healthcare professionals and provider organizations. Can you share what positive and negative reactions you have received from professional organizations and how you address them? Yeah, I should say I did not address them after I published the book. I did address them before I published the book. That could be the answer. So since 2008 to 2013, for the five years, I gave so many lectures to the hospitals and the academic conferences for so many different organizations and built a good network with them and even with some National Assembly members. So those are very important thing. And you know, usually in the book there's some recommendation on the front or back page or in the in the book actually in the, the cover of the book and all important people wrote a good recommendation and those are very important too for you to avoid or evade some you know, resistance from different organizations but I should be you know I want to assure you what I re recommend you that please uh, make a stakeholder list type things a list of potential stakeholders regarding the book or your project and just you know think about it, the, the potential reactions from them and according to that you have to be prepared or deal with it before you do or begin actual project or writing a book. Thank you Dr. Joan. Um, the next question um, addresses the uh, problem at the beginning of your presentation uh, where you have said that uh, many hospitals are understaffed and then at the end of your presentation that they're probably going to remain understaffed. So um, does your uh, message deal with that? Uh, why is that so? Why hospitals hire more healthcare professionals to improve patient safety? Isn't it a necessary uh, investment for patients? Would you uh, uh, did you address this in your book? Well, well, I did not provide the statistics about the numbers uh, or numbers of doctors or nurses in my book, and I, I didn't think that's a necessary question because I or well, we could not change the statistics. And think about it: the, the number of doctors or number of nurses or the number of hospitals or whatever infrastructure that to increase the number of them takes long takes longer time. Right? And so, well, yeah, I said they're understaffed. That's the, the, the reason why I mentioned that is just to describe the uh, situation of Korean healthcare atmosphere and the necessary investment. That's true. But the thing is, Korea has a national insurance system. It's, you know, the 100% of healthcare organizations should be under control. I should say, under control of national insurance system, and that the point of national insurance system is fixed price. So who fixed, who decide the price? Actually, the government. So the price is fixed. So how can they, how can hospitals can get the money to invest, to improve safety? That's not easy. I'm sure that those investments should be made sooner or later. But you know what? I have to save lives. Before I, before those investments actually made, so that's the mm, that's the reason why I chose this kind of soft approach with people. Thank you, Dr. Joan. Um, I think we will uh, finish our Q and A session with this last question. So, um, should we expect the uh, another book? Are you planning to write another book on patient safety, or maybe part two? 
Okay, that's yeah. To me, that's a very important question. So I yeah, well, maybe some people say yeah, you write a you wrote a book for general public, so you want some more fame or whatever. Well, that's not true. So my original plan, I wanted to write a professional book on patient safety. Yeah, I'm a professional kind of expert, but I found that writing a book for general public would be more effective and efficient way. For at least uh, at the moment. So now I wrote a book and now I'm working on the real book, real patient safety book for healthcare professionals. It will cover all the things including the disclosure type part and some you know, subtle part, the just culture, all important things that the general public do not need to fully understand. Now this is the second book and it's coming out in this upcoming summer, I think. Thank you, Dr. John. Um, well, we're looking forward to it um, and we hope that um, it, it will be translated into English as well. And as uh, to um, this webinar, just to remind everybody that the recording of this webinar will be available on ISCO website within 24 hours of an actual uh, actually taken place and any participants, fellowship program participants have, that have attended this webinar would be able to get the points for uh, taking part automatically and the participants who are going to watch the, re uh, the recording of this webinar will have to answer the compulsory question to be able to get credits. Uh, as uh, to uh, end the, the session today I would like to express a huge thanks um, to Dr. Joan for this very interesting and um, very informative uh, fairy tale and as to how should we be delivering the messages to general public and on behalf of WISCO we would like to thank him for this for uh, we would like to thank him for doing such brilliant work and also would like to thank all of the attendees for being such a wonderful audience and for sparing their time and attending the session today. Once again, Dr. Joan, thank you so much for delivering this webinar on ESCO's behalf and uh, I hope we will have uh, many more to come. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you and goodbye. <laughs>